No, I'll feel like tomorrow. Guaranteed. Okay, let's get started. Let me make sure this is working first. Hello? Okay, so before we get into today's lecture, there's a couple lab logistics um, that I need to go over. For your lab, okay, your, your trust lab, you all were in there yesterday. Okay, I don't know if you got your final design converged upon or if you've practiced, but we are having trust checkout times, okay, and those will begin today. And I'm going to post a Google Doc sign-up sheet. We can only check out five sets at a time because that's how many we have. And it will be on a first-come, first-served basis. That's really the only fair time to do it. Um, so I will post it right after you guys get out of physics, because I know there's a few people that aren't in physics, so just to be fair. Um, and I need to get back to my office and make the doc. Um, so there will be three checkouts. Uh, they'll begin today at 5, so from Wednesday at 5 to Thursday at 5, Thursday at 5 to Friday at 5, Friday at 5 to Saturday at 5. Okay, so there's three checkouts, all that are 24 hours. Um, it's a first come, first serve basis. And use that time to practice, okay? Because when you come in next Tuesday, your design needs to be ready, okay? Your number of builders, your, your final design, okay? It's timed, right? So you want to get that honed in on. If you're done and you feel confident about it, that's totally fine. Um, there will be a, there will be four sets that, aren't, that won't be in use during the competition for you to practice, okay? How I'm going to structure it is I'm going to randomly assign the groups okay, to your time slots, and I'll post that on Canvas. I'm just going to use a, a random number generator. I'm going to assign groups to certain time slots in their lab section. Okay? So for tho that group, and I don't know who's when, but for that group at 8 a.m. or 8.30, however we structure it, okay, I'm going to be getting to our lab at 7, so you guys can come in and practice, um, because I know there's a couple days in between that you might forget. Um, so you'll be able to come in early and, and practice probably out in the hallway. Um, but I will let you know your time slots uh, later this week. Okay. So their time slots, they'll be 20 or 30 minutes in duration. Okay. It's up to you, and that's all you have to be. That's all you have to come to lab. Okay. That's up to you to be there on time. Your time starts, if you, sh if you show up late okay, and you can't finish, we need to keep on schedule because we have so many groups to get through. All right. Are there any questions? Yeah, Nick? Uh, are you allowed to use the hanging of the yes, thank you for reminding me. You are allowed to use the hanging. Um, so a couple, there were a couple groups that kind of hung uh, from their, their connections off of the abutments and came down. That's fine. Okay. And I also want to clarify about, your, um, about that center member, that center joint. Okay. We have a joint, okay, and there's probably a few, few designs. Some may look like that. Some may just look like that. Some may look like that. Okay. The center joint. Okay. That's up to you how you design it. Okay. And it is up to you to choose which one of these, these members that we're measuring the force in. Okay, so that's a design constraint that you that's up to you. Okay? Are there any questions about how we're gonna do that? We're just going to be inserting a strain gauge right in one of the members and measuring the force. Okay. So you want your force in each member to be lower or higher? Lower. Why? Why is it good to have a lower force in a truss? Less money, yeah. Okay. Granted, we haven't talked about material properties or fatigue or any of those things, but when you're designing things, you want, speci specifically structures, you want to design them to last. Okay, so you want them to be as minimally loaded as possible. <coughs> okay? So this part is up to us. We're just going to slap a strain gauge on and measure the force, and that will go into your cost function. All right, any other questions on lab? You all good? Everyone knows their prizes involved? Very prestigious prizes. All right. So I'll post that checkout later today, okay, after your physics class. And it's up to you to sign up and come check, come grab your trust set. Uh, if, if you sign up for today, come grab that tonight. All right. So today's lecture is our last, uh, our last lecture on module three. 
okay, our structure module. It's our shortest module, it's the most applicable. Okay. So we began last week using the method of joints on trusses, okay, last Wednesday. Then we started with the method of sections. Okay, we had two days on trusses. Okay, on Monday we covered frames, and today will be machines. Okay, so in mechanics, those are our three very broad, uh, broad categories of structures, that we have trusses, frames, and machines. Okay, and so today we're wrapping up that module with machines. So this module three is what you were tested on on Monday. Okay, so trusses, frames, and machines. Okay, so I hope it feels a little more um, grasp, you were able to grasp it a little more because it's shorter and studying's a little easier. Okay, but what we cover on Friday won't be on the test. All right, so machines, okay, this is when we can actually start to make design decisions to give us mechanical advantage. Because machines are designed to transmit or modify an input force. Okay, so in other words, machines are taking an input force okay, and they're changing it, they're transmitting it, they're modifying it into an output force. Okay, so with that being said, how, how is that different than uh, tr frames and trusses? Machines are changing forces. What do frames and trusses do? Yes, Stefan? <coughs> What's that? They're rigid bodies, so they don't move. Half right, frames and trusses and machines are all rigid bodies. Okay, they're all composed of three non-collinear points that don't change. They don't have any moving parts. Okay, frames are frame or machines are fully or partially constrained. Okay, but in terms of their loading conditions. What are frames and trusses designed to do? Yeah, Drew? They're supposed to resist the forces. Resist the forces. Perfect. Say it louder, Jack. So frames and trusses are designed to just hold loads. Okay, they're static structures. They're just designed to hold loads and not kill people. Okay. Machines are designed to input that, to have that input force, use mechanical advantage, and change it. Okay? So with that being said, okay, get out your clickers, your phones, okay, and I want to talk about this idea, oh, it didn't save. Shoot. Okay. That's okay. So this whole concept of a partially constrained frame or, uh, excuse me, a partially constrained machine. Okay, what does that mean? Hang on, start a session. So our ID is SQP. I apologize for the um, slide not being there. Okay, but our, our partially constrained frame what does that mean for the number of degrees of freedom in comparison to a frame or a truss? Okay, so your answer A, there's more degrees of freedom. Answer B, there are less degrees of freedom. C, they are equal. D, we don't have enough information to answer. So what does it mean, what does it mean with this partially constrained machine? How does that change the degrees of freedom in comparison to a frame or a truss? <coughs> does the question make sense? You're confused, Morris. I don't know what the question is. <laughs> so a, a machine is partially constrained, right? We haven't talked about it today yet, but you read about it last night. Machines are partially constrained. We know that frames and trusses are fully constrained. They're rigid. What does that mean about the degrees of freedom? How do those degrees of freedom compare? Is it working? Nope. Okay. So just 60 seconds. Think about how those degree of degrees of freedom are affected by the number of constraints in your system. And feel free to talk about it. OK, 
Okay, we'll go for about 30 more seconds. All right, I'm going to close it. So we have the overwhelming majority. 70% of you chose A, in that there are more degrees of freedom in a machine than a truss or a frame. Okay, 15% of you chose B, and 9% of you chose C. Okay, so who's a brave soul that can tell us why they chose A? Yeah, Jack? I think you're on the right track. Did somebody else put it in their own words? Someone else who chose A? Yeah, Keenan? I don't know if this is like the same exact thing, but the amount of constraints in the system, um, it's only in one direction instead of like, it's fully constrained. So the, if, since there's less constraints, there's more degrees of freedom. Exactly. So I think between Keenan and Jack, Okay, their thinking is completely correct. Constraints do what? Constraints. <laughs> they constrain motion, whether it be translation or rotation, right, depending on the connection. Constraints restrict motion. Okay. So a machine is partially constrained. Okay. It can move. Machines can move. Okay. I know that's a little wonky in statics when we say everything's, uh, everything's stationary, and we'll touch on that. But machines can move. They have degrees of freedom because the number of constraints are reduced. Okay. So if a machine is fully constrained, and that can happen, and we'll do an example where that does happen, a machine can be fully constrained. What does that tell you about the movement in the machine? The movement in that mechanism. Can it move? No, no because it's fully constrained. Okay. So if you have less constraints, you have more degrees of freedom. Okay. Less constraints allows you to move more in more directions, depending on whether we're in two or three dimensions. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's talk about this concept of simple machines, okay, and then we'll get into kind of why machines can move. Okay, but simple machines, I think you all had this, you covered this in concepts or whatever Dr. Rozelle's class is called. Okay. I always forget. Okay. Simple machines. Okay. In this class, we will analyze machines that are composed of these simple machines that are levers and wheels and pulleys and screws and wedges and inclined planes and wheel and axle. Okay. These are all designed to do what? Even simpler. Transmit or modify force. Excellent, Drew can read the definition, okay? <laughs> These are all changing your mechanical advantage, right? They're changing your input. They're modifying your input force to change the output force, okay? So the most simple example is a pair of pliers, okay? Well, not the most simple, but the most simple example that we've all used, okay? Everybody's held a pair of pliers. And if you haven't, come to our office and maybe don't build anything for a while, okay? So this pair of pliers okay, are designed to modify the input force. Okay, what's the input force? As you squeeze, you squeeze those handles. Okay, you're squeezing the handles, you're applying a force to those blue handles. And what is the output force? What are you modifying? What are you trying to do with a pair of pliers? Squeeze something? Do you just squeeze a bolt and hold it there? Okay. You're applying a force, okay? We're applying that force to either twist or tighten or whatever you do with a pair of pliers. But that output force is the force on the, the grips of the pliers 
onto that, that screw or that bolt or that nut or whatever have you. Okay? So to solve, to solve machines, okay, we, have a very we have a very similar method in comparison to frames. Okay? So I want to look at this example, this variable example okay, of a pair of pliers. And it asks us to determine this output force okay, as a function of our input force of our hand. Okay? So with machines, okay, it's very similar to frames. Okay. When you have a machine, you're going to yank out the rigid body, okay, draw your forces on the rigid bodies okay, of those components, and apply your equations of equilibrium. Okay. So with this first step, and I apologize in advance, I'll kind of be flipping back and forth between these, these two slides. Okay. We begin at the known input force. Okay. Always begin at the known input force. And that won't be totally apparent in this particular example, but in the following examples it will be. Okay, so if we begin at the known input force and we draw our free body diagram to solve for those unknown internal reactions. Okay, I want to talk about those first two points here. Okay, so we begin at our known input force. So I draw the free body diagram okay, of that, that bottom vice. Okay, our known input force is force F, that bottom handle. Okay. So we begin at a known input force. We've extracted this rigid body. Okay. And your second step was to solve for the unknown internal reactions. So what are our reactions here? What holds together pliers? Pin A. Okay. We have a constraint at A. Okay which we will just indicate with AY and AX. It's just a pin, right? Those two pieces, okay, unless it's like a wrench, whatever those, those pliers are called. In this particular set of pliers, they can rotate with respect to each other, but they're not translating. So we know there's constraint in the X and Y direction. Okay. How do you draw that output force? This force on the bolt. Yeah, Carson? We can draw it up, okay? This force on the bolt, okay, that I will indicate with C. Okay? So for example's sake, I'm not going to do what I told you and to immediately start solving for the unknown forces because I wanted to address another point. Okay, but if this was a frame, we were solving this as a frame, okay, we'd go forth to another another rigid body. Okay, so I will start with that. Oh, Okay, the top, the top pliers, that top vice. Okay, we draw our forces. We have our known force F. Okay, we also have a constraint at A. Okay, this is a shared constraint between the top and bottom vices. So how do we draw those constraint forces? Equal and opposite. Equal and opposite. Okay, and remember, direction is arbitrary here. Okay, for these internal reactions, direction is arbitrary. Okay, because these are shared connections, we know that they are equal and opposite. Okay. Similarly for that input or that output force, excuse me, we draw it equal and opposite and we'll indicate that with a negative uh, a force in the negative j direction. <coughs> All right. I can also draw a free body diagram of the bolt. Okay, this is a rigid body. It has forces acting on it. Okay, this output force, C, okay, occurs at both sides of the bolt, on both faces of the bolt, wherever that point of contact is. Okay, so we've already done more work than what our method is telling us to do, but that's okay. Okay. We draw our free body diagrams at the known in at starting with the known input force and we solve for our internal reactions. Okay. So let's work with this top or this bottom vice and solve for these known internal reactions. Okay. Or solve for what, what are we even solving for? Okay, we're solving for F, right? 
Can we solve that right away? Can we solve f? Or sorry, can we solve c? We're solving for c, that output force. We know f. How? We can sum the moments at a. Okay. If we sum the moments at a, these constraint forces are not applying any torque at a. So we can immediately get rid of them and answer the question. Okay. So if we sum the moments at a, sum the moments at a, it's an equilibrium, it's statics, nothing's moving. Okay. We will get minus F times its effective moment arm of L. Okay, F is applying a clockwise rotation about A. Okay, plus C times its effective moment arm of J. All of this equals zero, and our only unknown in this case is C. Yeah? Isn't the moment FL positive? So R of A with respect to O? Are you saying that's negative in the J? Is that what you're getting at? You do. Okay. But who can answer that using our, our, scalar, our, si our scalar sign convention? Nicole's asking, why is the moment that this force F, why is it negative? Yeah, Drew? So it's going in the clockwise direction. If you look at the way the force is oriented and then the moment arm, you can just, you, you did it with the pencil. Or with a ruler, but you do like that, okay. and you can see that it's rotating clockwise. Okay. So with our scalar shortcut, and remember in these planar problems, we can solve this with our scalar shortcut. We don't have to go through all those cross products. Okay. But this rotation that F is causing with respect to O, okay, if you get your pencil out, I'm fixed at A, I'm applying an upward force that is a clockwise rotation. And recall in the right hand rule, clockwise is negative. So even though we are located in the negative J and negative I, okay, our moment arm, okay, R of A with respect to O, if we go through that vector algebra, you would get a negative moment. Okay. So that's the sign, that's kind of the trade-off with doing this scalar shortcut, is there is intuition. <coughs> if you solve these with vectors, which is fine, it's more math, okay, but the sign convention will, will be told to you. Whereas with these planar problems, you are you have to decide that. Does that answer your question? Okay. So if we solve for C, we get C is F, that input force, times a ratio of L over J. Okay. So what, what does this mean in terms of how your output force is being modified? Yeah, Carson? Excellent. Carson says your output force is larger than your input force as long as L is greater than J. Okay. You can qualitatively feel this, and I should have brought a pair of pliers in, but if you apply that force closer to the point of rotation, okay, it's harder to turn the bolt, right? And that's because your moment arm of where you're applying the force about the point of rotation is larger. Okay. So this is a mechanical advantage. This L over J is a mechanical advantage. You are modifying the force, okay? and that's because of this moment arm. So as long as L is greater than J, your output force will continue to increase. Okay, and that's one of the reasons why machines are so big, because they take advantage of that moment arm. Okay, does that make sense? So let's also talk about this, this method, okay? We immediately say we need to begin at the known input force and solve for these internal reactions. So in this problem, 
How many free body diagrams did we use to actually solve for C? Say it with conviction, Morris, not just your finger. We only used one. Okay. Machines, the analysis is very similar to the method of sections. Okay. We're only solving for what we need. Okay. So when you're analyzing machines, you begin with your known input force and you propagate through the rigid bodies, okay, depending on what you need. With frames, remember we had to draw all of the free body diagrams, okay, have all of our internal forces be equal and opposite, we had to solve for them simultaneously. Okay. Where there's the method of sections with trusses was a little bit of a shortcut. We went right to what we needed. Okay. The same is the case with machines. Okay, so let's do an example, okay, that we can actually apply that, that idea. Okay, so in this example, we have a lot going on. Okay, before we even start solving it, why is it a machine? It's not fully constrained. Where is it not fully constrained? What? At B. Okay. There is only a constraint force at B in the vertical direction. Right? We're free to slide. Okay. So when this, I know in the reading quiz, a lot of you were confused about if machines can move, why are we in statics? Okay. That's a completely fair question. Okay, but in statics, we are solving static machines. Okay, that's completely counterintuitive. Okay, but we're only solving these at an instant in time. Okay. If we were to count for the motion, this would become a dynamics problem. We would have to take into account the angular velocities and acceleration of these rigid bodies. Okay. So in statics, we know they move. Okay, we can know we're moving at B. Right? Just with our intuition of what our constraint forces look like, we know we have a degree of freedom at B in that horizontal direction. But we're solving it at an instantaneous point in time, so our equilibrium equations are upheld. Yes, Stefan? Um, even though you're not moving at B, it's also moving at B and C, and then rotating about B. Yep. Okay. A and C and D, well, D is pinned. Okay. There, it's rotating at D, it's not translating. But C and A can translate. Okay. There's a lot of degrees of freedom, it's completely partially constrained. But in order to stop that motion, okay, if B is fixed, A and C inherently can't move. And that's just with an intuition, just a qualitative analysis. Okay, if we went through and did our math, it may make, may, may make more sense. Okay, but you're right, in this, in this case, A and C are translating also. Okay. But does that clear up some, qu some questions about, well, machines can move, but we're in statics? Okay, we know F equals MA, but in statics, F equals zero. Okay, they move, and the only reason in statics, that, or the only reason we care about that in statics is because of the partial constraints. Okay. So we have this problem. Let's look at our method. We begin with a known input force. Okay. So we're immediately going to extract what member? ABC. Okay because that's where our known input force is. Okay, so we draw all of our forces, known and unknown. Okay, we have our known input force that's acting at C, and we have some constraints here at B, at B, or acting at A, and we have some constraints at C and B. What do those constraints look like? Yes, sir? Um, at B, there is a constraint in the Y. At B, there is a constraint in the Y because we are free to translate in the X. Is that it? Say it louder. At C. At C, what do those look like? It's a pin constraint, right? There needs to be a constraint in the x and the y, otherwise there's nothing keeping these two linkages together. Okay. So we begin with this known input force, 
Okay, and on your notes, there was a typo. I did not specify what theta was. Okay, but I've updated it on the slides. They ask for when theta equals zero, what are the internal forces, or excuse me, what is the moment required to maintain equilibrium? If that moment, okay, is way less than your input force, is it going to be in equilibrium? It's going to move, right? Think about it. If, if we apply a force at A, okay, this whole bar is going to slide over. Okay, C is going to have to come down and to the right. Okay, because this moment, its magnitude is so small. But if we increase that torque at D and resist the rotation at C, Okay, we will be able to counterbalance that force and maintain equilibrium. Okay. So using your, the method, okay, we begin at the known input force and we immediately start solving for these internal reactions. Okay. So we have three unknowns here without raising any green flags. No? Do you want to do it like frames and just solve for everything and just throw up math on the, on the board. Yeah, Nick? You, you could take the moment about C. That's exactly right. We can immediately get rid of two of our unknowns. So if we take the moment at C, okay, what are we solving for? BY. We take the moment at C, well, BY, times its effective moment arm of 160 millimeters plus our known input force, which is acting at an angle at theta equals zero, so it's in the horizontal direction, okay, in the I direction, okay, times its effective moment arm of 500 millimeters. Solving for BY, we get negative 750 newtons. Yeah, Keenan? What about the X direction? What about the X what direction? For AY, I mean, for the moment about C from A. Isn't there also a Y and X direction? From of the force? Yeah. So there is, okay, but the problem statement said that theta is equal to zero. Okay, so this force is oh, actually acting, okay, and that, that's a typo in your notes, Sorry. okay, so make sure you all update your notes, but this force is acting only in the I direction. So its effective moment arm has to be in the, I heard it, in the Y, in the J, okay, we have to be orthogonal, okay. So we solve for BY, okay, we can continue to solve for these unknowns, right, by applying our equations of equilibrium. So if we sum the forces in the y, okay, we will get Cy minus 750 newtons, that By, that constraint at B, equals zero. Solving for Cy, okay, we get an equal and opposite in direction to that of By. Okay. We can then apply our third equation of equilibrium. We can sum the forces in the x. Okay. We'll get Cx minus 240. Okay, because this force is acting in the i direction. Equals zero. Solving for Cx. We get 240 newtons. Okay. So we've fully satisfied the first two steps of this method in the analysis of machines. We've began at the input force, we've drawn our free body diagram, and we've solved for these internal reactions. This third step tells us to draw the free body diagram of the connecting links. Okay. There's a couple connecting links here, right? We have a link at B, and we have a link at CD. Okay. If this was frame, if this was a frame, we'd have to draw all three of these links. Okay, but with machines, you only really care about, you only analyze what you care about. So in this problem, what link do we care about? 
Say it loud, Sally. CD, right? That's where we're solving for the moment. There's no need to solve for the reaction force at B because we've already done it. Okay. So if we draw a free body diagram at CD, we have a pin constraint at D, dy and dx. Okay. D is free to rotate, okay, but it cannot translate. Okay. And there's also this externally applied moment. Okay. It's still a pin constraint, but we are applying a moment. Okay. And this is what we're solving for. Okay. And we also have our constraints, our constraint forces at C. Okay. Because these are shared forces, we need to draw them equal and opposite. Okay. So I don't want you to get confused with even though we've found these sign, the sign conventions of CX and CY to both be positive, that's only on member ABC. Okay. These are shared external reactions. Okay. They're not internal forces. They're not tension or compression forces. Okay. So we know our signs have to be equal and opposite on shared connecting members. Does that make sense? Okay, so for solving for this moment, how would you do that? Yeah. Some of the moments about D, because it's a vector, it's a free vector, okay, it still applies anywhere on that rigid body. If we sum the moments at D, that applied moment is still acting at D. Okay, so we get M plus 750, this force in the vertical direction, times its effective moment arm of 300 millimeters, okay, minus 240, that constraint force in the X direction that's causing a clockwise rotation. So it is negative times its effective moment arm of 125. So we can easily solve for our moment. We have one unknown in this equation. We solve for a moment, we get it equal, equivalent to 195,000 Newton millimeters. If we change the orientation of our force, is this moment going to stay the same? Got a couple no's. Got everybody else still sleeping? It's only Wednesday, guys. It's not even Friday. If we change the orientation of our force, okay, so maybe it is acting at an angle of 30 degrees. Is this moment required to maintain equilibrium going to stay the same? Probably not, right? Because our constraints at C are going to change. Our constraints at B are going to change because we have rectangular components now of our <coughs> force. Okay? So this is only for this very discrete instant in time okay, that we are maintaining equilibrium. Yeah, Carson? What direction? This, so this is positive? This is I got negative. Did I miss the sign? Probably. Okay. Yeah, always check my signs. Okay. So even though we know it's moving just at this discrete instant in time, if we apply this moment at D, we maintain our <coughs> equilibrium equations. Okay. So why with machines? <coughs> Can we only analyze this one, one free body diagram if needed? Okay. What's different about machines and, and frames and trusses? <coughs> yeah, Keenan? One moment might be like it's not equal to zero. So like you know for a machine that automatically one moment is not equal to zero. Because there's constantly like a moving part. Is this 
personal constraint. I don't, f I'm not sure I understand. Okay, there might be, we can be, have a machine and have all pin connections yeah. and there's no moment. This is just an applied moment. Okay, yeah. but I'm thinking more in terms of the constraints. Why can we just solve machines with one free body diagram? <coughs> yeah, Carson? There's fewer constraints, so there's less things to solve for. Exactly. Carson says there's fewer constraints, so there's less things to solve for. <laughs> if this was a frame, and I'm analyzing member ABC, I have my known input force, we have a reaction at B, I now have to have a reaction in X. Okay, we have our reactions at C also. We can't solve this. There's four unknowns. We only have three <coughs> equations of equilibrium. Okay. So in machines, there are less unknowns. Okay, that's the great part. So you can just dive right in okay, and solve what you need. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's keep going. Let's keep going in difficulty here. Okay. So this problem is asking us, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to find this force F, this hanging force F, that F that's off this cantilever beam, required to maintain equilibrium. If it's too large. What's going to happen? It's going to get pulled down, right? If this is a ton, okay, and I'm only applying a six pound force, okay, I'm not going to be able to maintain that. If this force F is too small, okay, what, what's going to happen to the system? You're going to pull it back, right? That six pound, that six pound force is going to, to be greater. All right. So we're, we're asked to find this force F that, that will maintain equilibrium, okay? And we impose equilibrium through our equations, okay? So in this problem, where do you start? The picture's a little counterintuitive, okay? And this, it's a good example because there's a lot going on, okay? But I would never give you something this muddy on an exam. Okay, so this is a two-dimensional problem. Okay, it's kind of like a cantilever crank. Okay, so we can translate, we're translating at B in the X direction. We're not going up and down. Okay, and we're, we're there's a pin connection at A. Okay, so all that being said, let's just start with what free body diagram do we need to draw? We start with our known force. Okay, so our known force is this weird piece, okay, this AB, okay. So we have our known force, okay, that's applied with six pounds, okay. And the only reason I'm telling you, okay, I'm going to tell you the constraints because it's not clear from the picture. Okay, I would never give you a problem like this on the test but it's a good problem because there's a ton going on. Okay, but if you're ever not sure about like a constraint on a test, if you can't tell from the picture, ask right away. Okay, so we know that we're fixed. There's a pin connection at A. So our, this bar can rotate, rotate about A, but it can't translate. What are your constraint forces? AY and AX, right? We can rotate. <coughs> But in order for this piece to rotate, there has to be a degree of freedom at B. Right? So there's a slot that is allowed to translate about in this X direction. And it's oriented at kind of like an oblique angle, so it may be hard to tell. But if we're going to crank this over, B has to give. Okay? So there's only a constraint at B in the Y direction. Okay. So we drew our free body diagram at our known input force. And now we need to start analyzing for these unknowns. How would you do that? Some of the moments about A. Some of the moments about A. Exactly. 
We sum the moments about A. Okay, we'll get BY times its effective moment arm. Okay. Of four inches. Okay, minus six. Our known input force times its effective moment arm of 25 inches. So in solving for BY, we get it equivalent to 37.5 pounds. Okay, so then what do you do? We have two equations left, right? <coughs> sum the forces in the Y. It doesn't really matter which order we do, right? We sum the forces in the Y, we get 37.5. Okay, that BY force plus, plus AY equals zero. Okay, solving for AY, we get it equivalent to negative 37.5. So all that means is we've drawn it incorrectly on this free body diagram. Not a big deal. All right? So then we can sum the forces in the X, okay, and solve for AX pretty easily to be negative six pounds. So again, all that means is that we've drawn that constraint in the wrong direction. Okay. So we're up to step two. We've drawn the free body diagram at the known input force and we've solved for these internal reactions. Okay, step three tells you to draw the free body diagram of your connecting link. Okay. There's a lot of links here. Okay. What link do you really care about? What's that? Link A. This, this big one? Is that what you're meaning? Yeah. So there's not, a, there's not a link between this, this member and that member. Is that what you're saying? Oh, really? It's just a pin, a pin connection. This is just slotted in. Okay? So if there's a pin connection there, what link do you start with? The whole, like a link is like a whole piece. This whole piece, yeah. A member, so a link, a member. The right, yeah. This link is the member. I'm sorry. Okay, so yes, there is a pin connection at A, but when I was saying link, I was meaning what member. There's not a member connecting between this member and that member. I'm sorry. Is that cleared up? So that being said, what member do you progress through and solve? Heard a lot of mumbles. That, that big horizontal one where you have that unknown force. Is that what I'm getting? Right? That's fine. We don't need to go through and analyze all of these other unknown members. Okay? So if we draw our forces on this member, okay, we have this unknown force F. Okay? This output force F. Okay? And we have our constraint forces. Okay? In this problem, there is a pin constraint at D. So you know it can rotate but it cannot translate. And we also have our pin constraint at A, in which we need to draw equal and opposite to what we solved for in that first free body diagram. Okay. So drawing those, we have AY equivalent to 37.5 and AX equivalent to six pounds. All right. So to solve for this force F, can we do it? Sum the moments at D. It's okay that we don't know them. If we sum the moments at D, okay, we'll get this force F okay, that's applying a counterclockwise rotation okay, with respect to point D okay, times its effective moment arm of 39 inches. Okay, 
minus 6, this horizontal force at A, times its effective moment arm of 5 inches, that vertical distance between where that force is applied and point A, okay, minus 37.5 times 9. You guys have a physics test or something? So solving for this force F, we get it equivalent to 9.42 pounds. So if we hang a force of 9.4 pounds okay, and apply a 6 pound input force, we will maintain equilibrium. Okay. So there's one more example that I will post online in Canvas. Okay. You have a homework, homework set due on Friday. This concludes module three. All right. And don't forget about your trust checkouts. Okay, I'll post those at 11 today. First come, first serve. Make sure you go get them.